Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, your ticket to all things college football. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? Join us as we talk college football from the national championship to college rivalries to bowl games to the Heisman Trophy to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. My name is Ryan Lee. Once again, I am going to be your host, and with 2020 coming to a close, we can not only talk about the season that has just passed, but also everything coming forward in 2021. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about in that department, including... The Heisman race, the candidates have officially been released. The CFB is officially announced, and we're going to be going through the last of the conference finals, including the rest of the contenders for the CFP. That's all coming up, but let's start with this. Last time I was on the show, we talked about the Big Ten, and we talked about the ACC. You know, Notre Dame was kind of overwhelming in that ACC championship game. Clemson reaffirmed their dominance and why they're most likely the top contender in the entire CAA despite being a two seed. However, the SEC is most often regarded as the toughest conference in the NCAA as a whole. The SEC football is considered the toughest division in all of sports. I can't really contend with any other division that is just as challenging. Maybe the only one I can think of is the Big Ten in basketball. But the SEC in football is a very strange division because a lot of those things that go on within the SEC... They're not only very dominant, they're not only very good, but they also have a lot to be wondered about. A lot that where questions come about where you're not exactly sure what to expect or what to do about it because of the fact that certain things about the division are just so curiously weird that you just don't know what to expect from it. Like I think one example you could put from this past season was, yeah, you knew that Georgia was super dominant, at least on the defensive side. They had really good head coach in Kirby Smart. However, Stetson Bennett was very okay. You know, you also had these other teams like Texas A&M where they were so good up and down the lineup. Their biggest issue was they always choked in the biggest moments. Or you even had teams like Florida, a Heisman finalist, which I will get to in a little bit, but sometimes they just didn't show up when they needed to show up the most. They got complacent. They got lazy at times. And then you have Alabama, pretty much up and down the roster, talent on talent on talent on talent. The question was whether Mac Jones is legit or whether Mac Jones is a product of the talent around him. And I can get more to that later because I'm going to have a short spiel about the Heisman candidates, but... Let's start off with Alabama versus Florida in the SEC Finals first because I've gone over the conference finals for each of the remaining contenders in the CFP. I've gone over it for Ohio State when they beat Northwestern. I went over it when Clemson kind of dominated Notre Dame. But now we have to go through Alabama and Florida. This was a great game. I'm not going to lie about that one. This was easily the two best teams in the SEC, hands down, nothing about it. I don't think you could have put any other team in these circumstances and have a better football game in the SEC. You wouldn't really get that out of Texas A&M, I don't think. I really don't think you would have gotten it out of Georgia This was really the only contender that was 
worthy or they haven't made sense in this situation. And it provided a great game. A game where you had the number two and number three best quarterbacks in the game this year going blow for blow. Let me put it this way. If you're an NFL fan, imagine Aaron Rodgers versus Patrick Mahomes or Patrick Mahomes versus Josh Allen or Josh Allen versus Aaron Rodgers. Take any three combinations of those three quarterbacks facing off against each other and you already know it's going to be a great game and that is exactly what we saw. We saw the number two and number three best quarterbacks going at it in this game. My number one biggest gripe right now is the fact that Florida had a lot of easily avoidable mistakes and it's the fact that they're not careful enough, which is another reason why I didn't really have that much faith in Florida going into the game. I thought it was kind of a fluky decision. I thought it was a little bit strange, but also I thought that it could be potentially overcome, but it might still bite them in the end. Big time was not only turning the ball over, but also just the lack of awareness in the various situations that were going on. Because for Florida, we saw two instances, really three instances, where they essentially could have completely flipped the game around had it just been something as simple as ball security. I get that Florida is a bit more of a pass-heavy team. You know, they only ran for 54 yards and Kyle Trask passed for over 400 To be fair, Mac Jones also threw for 400, but at least the running game carried its way with Najee Harris having 178 and a pair of touchdowns. But at the same time, Florida's inability to keep the ball secure kind of bit them in the end. Because in one of those situations, Kyle Trask, he's standing still in the pocket, doesn't feel a defender coming, and then he gets the ball shot from his hand which in the NFL is going to be a very important skill to have. He's going to the draft this year 100%. I believe he's a senior. So yes, he is 100% going to go into the draft. So basically, if he does make it to the NFL and does play games, that's where one thing where Kyle Trask is going to struggle. He's a senior this year, so he has no choice but to declare for the draft. If he cannot feel when a defender is coming, not only to maybe tuck the ball in or maybe just throw the ball away or maybe when he's trying to scramble out of the pocket, not running straight into a defender. Now, pocket awareness is going to either kill Kyle Trask in the NFL when he gets there or what it's going to do is he's going to learn how to have that pocket presence and he's going to be much better because that's probably his biggest weakness right now. Another circumstance was weird. It was an intercepted ball by Alabama, but then the defender gets a little complacent, doesn't secure the ball as tightly as possible, and the Alabama receiver punches it out, and Alabama re-recovers. Someone please, what is that? I get you want to make a return, But, like, that's why a lot of people, when they have interceptions like that, they usually just run straight out of bounds. Or they secure it really tightly. Because they know that that interception, if it stays in their possession, they don't mess up and re-fumble it or anything like that. It's going to change a large chunk of the game. And guess what happened? Alabama scored on the ensuing drive after that, and the game was decided by a touchdown. It could have been Florida's touchdown, but it wasn't. Alabama was one of those teams that I always find really weird. Ever since I started watching anything relevant to the NCAA football, probably around the point of the past seven to eight years, the NCAA is really strange. Because of the fact that they always have so much talent. Like, I'll be honest about that. They have so much talent. Nick Saban is a great college coach. 
He didn't exactly pan out in the NFL, but since coming into the NCAA and taking over for Alabama, he's been stellar. And every single year, he has an amazing roster. And a lot of those times, they have Heisman winning or Heisman candidate players. Like, let me put it this way. Collegiately, he is absolutely outstanding. He is 163-23 and 23 in his current tenure with Alabama. Ever in the NCAA, 254-65-1. and 15-10 and 10 in bowl games. Take him in the NFL, he's 15-17. and 17. He's right around 500. Six national championships. Which sounds absurd, but it is. Let's just look back into this current tenure with Alabama. Started in 2007. He has created something absolutely monstrous in Alabama. And I can show you because it's going to go into my next topic a little bit. But part of that is because he always finds players who end up becoming the best in their position, at least in that moment, at least in those three to four years they're in his program. Whether or not they actually pan out in the NFL, that's a question for another day. But it doesn't matter because for his sake, at least, he only cares about those three to four years. He only cares about recruiting the next people for the school and bringing them in. And then in that case, building them up, developing them up so they can win the SEC, so they can win the national championship, so they can win all these bowl games, and then they can develop so well that they're NFL-ready talent. Whether or not they make it is up to them. Nick Saban has developed such a good culture that that's just the way it is. And ever since he started, let me list out some of the players that he has brought up who have made their way and found the most success in the NFL so far. If you just look up who has the most NFL players by college, Alabama's got the most, sitting at 56 as of the beginning of this year, and the next closest is Ohio State, and the gap is huge. The gap is about 11 players difference, which is pretty big, honestly. 56 players currently in the NFL have come from the Alabama Crimson Tide. And this is not a shabby list either. You got the likes of star receiver Amari Cooper, All-Pro Safety, Minka Fitzpatrick. Derrick Henry, who's easily going to win the rushing title for the second year in a row. Josh Jacobs, one of the best up-and-coming players in the entire NFL, especially at the running back position. Julio Jones, multiple-time All-Pro with Alabama. Calvin Ridley, another one of the best up-and-coming receivers in the NFL as we speak. Tua Tungavailoa, one of the best young quarterbacks in the league. Levi Wallace, probably, arguably, one of the best number two safeties in the entire league. Ryan Kelly, he's a Pro Bowl center. Like I don't know where you want me to keep going here. Mark Ingram, he's a Pro Bowl running back. Marlon Humphrey, all-pro cornerback. Like, where do I keep going here? It's hit after hit after hit with Saban. And it, the thing about it is that... And also, when they're in his program, they show up and they ball out and they go crazy. Do I blame him? Absolutely not. That's just the power of good recruiting. That's just the, go- the power of good play. My biggest question with Mac Jones is the same question I've had with the past several Alabama quarterbacks. You have Mac Jones, you have Tua, Jalen Hurts was before him, and then you kind of get into this giant list of who's who. So Mac Jones is currently a Heisman finalist. Cool. Tua Tungavailoa, currently in the NFL. He was second in the Heisman in 2018. Also pretty cool. And then you also have Jalen Hurts. He was second in Heisman voting last year. However, he was with Oklahoma, so that kind of doesn't count. But then you get all this list of who's who for the longest amount of time. Like Blake Barnett, 
Cooper Bateman, Jake Coker, Blake Sims, A.J. McCarron, Greg McElroy, John Parker Wilson, Brody Corlau. Like, who are half of these guys? And I think part of why you get a bunch of these who's who's worth of guys in Alabama is because the rest of the talent around them is so good that it makes an average quarterback look great. I'm not saying that Tua or Mac Jones or Jalen Hurts are average. Actually, let me take that back. Let me take Jalen Hurts out of that conversation because he didn't explode until going to Lincoln Riley in Oklahoma. So in this conversation, Jalen Hurts is out. I'm talking strictly with Tua and Mac Jones. I'm not saying either of them are a sole product of their NFL coaches and that Saban did nothing. I'm not saying they're a sole product of the talent around them. I'm saying that with some of the other quarterbacks that have been brought in before that, were they that good or were they just very okay and got brought up so much to the point where it made an average quarterback look outstanding? Honestly, that can be heavily debated. Maybe with more recent times with guys like Tua and guys like Mac Jones, it's possible for them to just be really good. Alabama's not going to be a quarterback factory like Oklahoma has been ever since Lincoln Riley has come to town. Baker, Kyler, Jalen Hurts, Spencer Radler. And he's only been there for four years, Lincoln Riley has. No, Nick Saban is a product of defense. He's always been a defensive-minded coach. And before the NFL, he was a defensive coordinator. However, Mac Jones is looking really good. Najee Harris looks really good. But also, that's a large chunk of the Alabama Crimson Tide formula. Pounding the ball. And keeping on the ground. Keeping that clock running. Dominating clock possession. Clock possession in the SEC Finals game was 35 minutes to 25. I believe Alabama gained over 600 yards... When Florida only gained just over 400. Alabama outrushed Florida by 130 yards. Because of the fact that it's part of the Nick Saban formula. There have been so many running backs that have won the Heisman. Or got really close to winning the Heisman. Ever since Nick Saban took over as coach in 2007. Mark Ingram won the Heisman. Trent Richardson came in third. Derrick Henry also won the Heisman. And throughout the entire year, there were questions about whether or not Najee Harris should have been in the ballot. It's part of that system. It's part of that coaching. It's outstanding. And it works oh so well. That's all I got for that in terms of the SEC Finals. And we're going to be going into the next topic. I brought it up several times throughout the last segment. The Heisman finalists. We've come down from... All of these teams and all these players down to four. Who are the four? And what do each of them bring? That's coming up right after this. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Back here on the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Once again, Ryan Lee here, and 
we just talked about the SEC Finals game, and we're going to be going into the next most important point to go over, which is arguably the most coveted trophy individually in all of college sports, which is the Heisman Trophy. And the Heisman is a little bit of a weird award, I'm not going to lie, because it's essentially awarded to the best player in the entire NCAA. Now, we have come down to four players who are left in the running for this award. It has come down to Devonta Smith, wide receiver for Alabama, Mac Jones, the quarterback for Alabama, Trevor Lawrence, quarterback for Clemson, and Kyle Trask, the quarterback for Florida. I'm going to start with Trevor Lawrence. So yes, he was out for a little bit due to the virus. However, he is often compared to some of the best QB prospects that have probably ever graced the NCAA as a whole. A lot of people say, oh, he is the best prospect since Andrew Luck. Or, oh, he's on that Peyton Manning caliber of a college prospect. You want to know something funny about Peyton and about Luck? Peyton was second in Heisman voting behind Charles Woodson, the cornerback, the longtime Raider, the longtime Packer, the former Wolverine. Oh, he's the best prospect since Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck finished second twice. Behind Cam Newton and behind Robert Griffin. The Panther, now Patriot quarterback from Auburn. And the Washington football team drafted quarterback. Bounced around a couple teams and now plays with the Ravens backing up Lamar Jackson. The former Baylor product. Do I think that from the eye test at least... Trevor Lawrence has been the best quarterback. 100,000%. And... That's what the ACC championship game for me just confirmed. It confirmed for me he's that good. It confirmed it for me. There's nothing else for me to say. He is that good. Even though Lawrence's numbers aren't the craziest, at least if you compare it to the way he's looked, he's looked easily the best that he's been. 100,000%. Now... Mac Jones and Devonta Smith are a very unique combination because I have not seen, at least from my findings in recent memory, and I'm talking about like 2000 on, number one, you barely find wide receivers as it is. Wide receivers in Heisman voting are rare as they are. I can give you the last wide receiver who's even nominated which was Amari Cooper in 2014 he came in third Larry Fitzgerald 03 he was second and then you get a little bit of who's who in there and the last wide receiver who actually won the Heisman was Desmond Howard but also if you look at the competition even if you look at the stats at the time versus how like their careers panned out it wasn't even that crazy to begin with anyways. Casey Weldon and Ty Detmer. Very okay, but not, you know, the greatest. And then you have guys like in the past 10 years or so where 1, 2, and 3 are almost guaranteed hits. I'd say if you look into the past couple of years of Heisman voting... You start at about 2014, every single player from that point on, whether they're first, second, or third, have been absolutely outstanding, but also have been hits in the NFL. So Mac Jones has been absolutely outstanding so far this year. He's completing 76% of his passes. He's got 3,700 yards. His touchdown and interception ratio is 32-4. to He kind of really knows how to work in that play action, kind of 
being able to use his feet a little bit, you know, gets a couple of yards here and there, gets the occasional touchdown every so often. But the thing about what I've mentioned so many times before is that duo, that trio, that backup guy that you have, uh, someone else usually on the team who can kind of help make the load a lot easier. Devonta Smith absolutely has been doing that. 1,500 yards, 17 touchdowns is absolutely nuts. That is actually an insane stat line. He's been absolutely posterizing defensive backs. And Devonta Smith is a very aggressive runner. Constantly better every single year in terms of receptions, yards, touchdowns, all that type of thing. He's been better every single year. Most people think he had a great season last year, but this year obliterates last year. He went from 68 receptions to 98 receptions. He went from 1,250 yards to 1,500 yards. He went from 14 touchdown passes to 17. Those jumps are humongous. Especially for a wide receiver. When you change quarterbacks, that can be tough. And the last guy I'm going to mention is not too shabby either. The last person we got to talk about is the Gator. Kyle Trask. He's had himself a great year so far. He's essentially made a potential NFL career out of this one year alone. 68% of his passes completed. 4,200 yards. 43 touchdowns to 8 interceptions. Which, by the way, every single one of those, except for completion percentage and the number of interceptions he's given away, all of those are better than Jones. But also you can argue that Trask has had a lot more iffiness to deal with. Like the fact that Mac Jones has only gotten sacked 10 times and the fact that Trask has been sacked 20 times by some shaky offensive line play. Getting 50 yards on the ground and three touchdowns doesn't really hurt either. If I had to pick who I think should win and my pick on who I think is going to win, they're going to be two separate people. If I had to pick who I think should win, it should be Trevor Lawrence. It absolutely should be. It's got to be. It makes no sense if it's not. But if I take my pick on who I think is going to win, it's probably going to be either Mac Jones or Kyle Trask because it's just the way the Heisman voting works. They just tend to give a little more favor to guys who you know really had outstanding runs when the rest of the career said otherwise. I don't know. That's just my interpretation of how that works. Because it's just kind of the trend I've been seeing lately. Like when Joe Burrow won, Jalen Hurts and Justin Fields were the runners up. When Kyler won, it was Tua and Haskins. When Baker won, it was Bryce Love and Lamar. Like, ever since the last wide receiver to win the Heisman, Desmond Howard, won in 1991, there has been one cornerback, Charles Woodson, seven running backs, the last one being Derrick Henry in 2015, and 21 quarterbacks. So just statistically speaking, Devonta Smith is out of it. It's out of Trask, it's Jones, or it's Lawrence. It's just a matter of whom. Something strange about the Heisman is I never always determined who's the best player in the league or the entire the NCAA in this case. I can give multiple instances where number two was better than number one. Or where number three was better than numbers one and two. Let's just go into the past decade. Cam has had the best career thus far. But I think if you compare how much time they've had too, I think Luck is actually better than Cam. RG3, everyone knows that Luck was better than RG3 in the long term. Trent Richardson ended up being a draft bust. Johnny Manziel, Monty Teo, and Colin Klein, only one of those players is still in the NFL is Monty Teo. Jameis Winston, Adrian McCarron, and Jordan Lynch. Winston's a backup, McCarron's a backup, Jordan Lynch, I don't even know if he's in the league anymore. Marcus Mariota, Melvin Gordon, and Amari Cooper. Marcus Mariota's a backup. Melvin Gordon's a starting running back for a very mediocre team. And the exact same with Amari Cooper as a number one wide receiver on a mediocre team. 
However, you take the past five years, and it has been hit after hit almost every single year in the past five years. One, two, and three are all hits. Derrick Henry is arguably the best wide receiver in the entire game. He is on pace to win the rushing title for the second year in a row. Christian McCaffrey is almost without a doubt the best dual threat running back in the league. Kind of being that run and pass threat for Carolina. Deshaun Watson is the only thing saving the Houston Texans right now. You go to 16, Deshaun Watson is second. The third place in 2016 actually wins in 2017. That's Baker Mayfield. He's one of the reasons why the Cleveland Browns are still relevantly good. And then you get Lamar Jackson, who won in 2016 and came in third in 2017. MVP of the league last year. Which, by the way, is absolutely nuts. Like he was an MVP in his second year. Kyler Murray, he made his first Pro Bowl this year for the NFL from uh, 2018, winning the Heisman and made his first Pro Bowl. Tua just got drafted, too soon to tell. Dwayne Haskins, without a doubt, considered a draft bust. He's been all over the place. He's had good games, he's had bad games, he's had maskless photos of him in adult clubs during a pandemic. Nothing really saying Dwayne Haskins. The league messed up. No, I think those first 14, 15 teams were right to pass on Haskins. And of course, the one team who took a chance on him and even cut him was arguably the worst ownership, the worst general manager, and the worst team at the time. And arguably the worst run organization. Did you see any of the Dan Snyder stuff that was posted by the Washington Post over the summer? Stuff wasn't good. And then you have last year. Of course, it's too early to tell yet for any of those three guys. But Justin Fields, he had a rough year this year. And that showed in the Big Ten Championship game. Jalen Hurts has taken over for Carson Wentz. It is most likely the next starter for the Philadelphia Eagles. And Joe Burrow is most likely the lord and savior of the Cincinnati Bengals. That's just the way it is. That's what it looks like. So the Heisman isn't everything. But it can show a lot, at least in terms of what it can hold for you. If you even go from 2000 to 2010, a lot of these guys either, a lot of these guys who won the Heisman, there were easily better candidates in number two and number three almost every single year. To be fair, Chris Winky winning the Heisman back in 2000, Drew Brees is third. He is the leader in yards and touchdowns in the NFL right now. Eric Couch, Rex Grossman, Ken Dorsey, nothing crazy there. 2002, Carson Palmer had a great career. However, in 2003, Jason White, you had Larry Fitzgerald and Eli Manning right behind him, two Hall of Famers. Matt Leiner, yes, I understand he was the best quarterback in football at the time, but then you also had Adrian Peterson right behind him, a surefire Hall of Famer. Reggie Bush... Got the Heisman stripped away from him, but also Matt Leiner and Vince Young, they were both dominant back in those mid-2000s. 2006, Troy Smith, Darren McFadden, and Brady Quinn. Not very much to go off of there. 2007, Tim Tebow, who did have a great year, to be fair, but Darren McFadden and Colt Vernon were not much better. Sam Bradford, kind of derailed his career due to injury, followed by Colt McCoy and Tim Tebow. Not really much to bestow upon there. Mark Ingram. Has had several Pro Bowls, followed by Toby Gearhart and Colt McCoy, who Colt McCoy is a backup. Toby Gearhart, I don't even think he's in the league anymore. And Mark Ingram, he has just been out this year due to injuries. So, what did I prove by listing all of those players? I prove that winning the Heisman doesn't determine your career path, but it does show that it definitely has a good indicator as of recently of the trajectory it has. And sometimes it's not all about the Heisman itself, but sometimes it's about just finishing on the podium. It's not about winning the gold all all the time. In this instance specifically, 
because there have been many instances where number two or number three have outperformed number one. Sometimes it's injuries, sometimes it's bad organizations, whatever it may be. Congratulations to the Jacksonville Jaguars. You got yourself Trevor Lawrence. Whoever else around the league is going to take Mac Jones, is going to take Kyle Trask. Congratulations to them as well. Right now, it looks like it's the Jets in second. Who knows what they're going to do, if they're going to move off of Sam Darnold or not. Then you get Miami, who's probably going to take Devonta Smith because they really need of a receiver. Could Atlanta move off of Matt Ryan? Could Detroit move off of Matt Stafford? Could Carolina try to develop someone underneath Teddy Bridgewater? Could Denver move off of Drew Locke? Could Minnesota move off of Kirk Cousins? Could New England try to draft and develop a quarterback? Who knows? We'll see. But all we know is that generational prospect always goes to the worst team. In a lot of those instances, they build around him. In some cases, you can pull an Eli. You can put an out. El- you can pull an Elway. Just say I refuse to play for this team and get traded immediately. Look at how it worked out for them. Just saying. That's been it on the Heisman. And we're going to be going to our previews for the college football semifinals coming up right after this. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. here for the final time here on the GSMC College Football Podcast. Ryan Lee back here once again. And we have got one final topic to go through with the new year coming in. Only one thing comes around with the end of 2020 and the introduction of 2021. You know, we've got the NFL playoffs coming up really soon. The NBA just kicked off their season. The NHL is starting up in about two weeks. Only NCAA, the CFP, the college football playoffs, start on New Year's Day on the college football playoff semifinals. And if I had to say anything, at least in terms of the college football playoffs itself, these are without a doubt the two best games probably of the entire year. It's simply... It's the four best teams going up against each other. That's all I can really say about it. Like, what else can you really say about it? It's the top four teams. It's the final four. You know, you know that when you are the final four teams in any sport, 
That means you are at the best and at the pinnacle of where you are. Even when you have weird tournament situations like, you know, the NCAA basketball, you got March Madness, you've got the playoffs for all the various different sports, you know, and the NFL, at least this year, it takes from 14 teams and then it gets down to one in the NHL and the NBA, it goes from 16 teams down to one, except with the respective bubbles in the NBA this year, it was more than the traditional 16. I believe the exact number was something in the ballpark of, I think, 20 to 21. I can't think of the actual number off the top of my head. In the NHL, I know it was 24 teams who won in the playoffs, and they narrowed it down to one. So playoffs typically have that really weird formula where they have so many teams going up against each other, and they finally narrow it down to the last one. Now, the CFP's format is one that I personally have never been that fond of. You only have four teams, and the four teams are essentially ranked by the committee. And there's only four teams. I know in college football, at least, the teams who go from, let's say, like five to about ten are very good, but they might not be able to stand or put up such a great fight against some of those top tier teams, top two to three teams. And then when you get to about 10 to about 16, they're good, but they're not going to put that big of a fight either. The logic behind why the NCAA's playoff system is the way it is, when you put it that way, I can argue that it makes sense. I can argue for the logic behind it. However, what you're doing is you're getting a lot of these teams who are in these bowl games, and it's essentially for pride. You know, just in general, sports provides a big platform for hope, for optimism, for just something positive going on, especially in the world right now where there's just so much negative energy going around. There's all this stuff going around where, you know, people might be negative, where people might not be feeling the greatest for whatever reason, whether if it's, you know, health right now, financially, etc. Sports provides a lot of positive energy. For those who may not know, I've mentioned this before, I'm currently living in Miami right now, and the Dolphins are so close to making the playoffs. And if they do make the playoffs, I can tell Miami's going to buzz for a good amount of time. I was in Miami when the Heat were, I think, the top eight teams and they just made it to the conference finals and there was such a great buzz such a great energy around Miami because the Heat had a good shot they were down to the final four teams and everyone in Miami was so hyped up so excited and like they were just positive all the way around it's going to be the same way for a lot of these teams however the issue is is that there's only four teams who get that type of expression. It's Alabama, it's Clemson, it is Ohio State, and it's Notre Dame. That's it. A&M does not get that. Florida does not get that. Cincinnati does not get that. A lot of these teams who are more than deserving and have great seasons so far, they're not going to get that. Like Oklahoma, they started rough in the beginning of the season, had a great push. They could potentially at least make it competitive. Let's say hypothetically in 18 format, they would play Ohio State. They could make that game competitive with how good the offense is. Spencer Rattler versus Justin Fields, it'd be a shootout. Or let's say you put, you know, some of these other teams like like Florida in there. They've been very competitive. They were only down a touchdown to Alabama. Maybe they could at least give Clemson a fight. You don't really know with a lot of these teams because they're not given that chance. They're not given that do or die situation where they have a chance to go all out 100%, 100% of the time. You don't get a lot of that from a lot of these teams because you only really see it from four of those teams. You get it from Clemson, Alabama, Notre Dame, and Ohio State. You do not get it from these A&Ms, these Floridas, these Oklahomas, these Cincinnati's, etc. Because they never get that shot. I said it about a month ago. 
this is the perfect year for the FPS to go to an 8 or 16 team system. Because they can use COVID as an excuse. Oh, why would you put 8 teams in the playoffs? It's typically 4. Why would you give 12 more teams a shot at the trophy in this 16 team system? Oh, it's because COVID messed up everyone's schedules and some teams are playing five games, some teams are playing 11, and it just doesn't make, and we need to figure that out. Give them all a chance because their schedules got messed up by this virus. That could have been the most easy out for a chance in an eight or a 16 team playoff. And the committee could have just been like, hey, we're just trying something out and we're going to give it the opportunity it gets because of the fact it's a pandemic year. But we're not going to get any of that. Do I think they're going to change to an eight-team system soon? Yes. But do I also think that the eight teams that we have so far were so good, they could have at least given a fight to some of these top-tier teams? Also, yes. A lot of those other teams, however, have already played their bowl games. I believe that if you had the other teams from five to eight playing They could have at least given it a great, great effort. Sure, Oklahoma and Florida was a bit of a mismatch. You know, Cincinnati's playing Georgia. But at the end of the day, we have got four teams left to go. Notre Dame, Alabama, Clemson, and Ohio State. I'm going to start with the game that we saw last year. Clemson versus Ohio State. We saw this exact game last year. I personally remember that game very well. I was at a Christmas party over at my cousin's house. And I was watching that entire game. And I remember being at the edge of my seat, essentially, where Justin Fields threw that costly interception in the end zone. And the touchdown and the ensuing extra point would have put Ohio State on top. But Clemson ended up narrowly squeaking it out by just a little over a touchdown. Right now, the line for Clemson is sitting at 7. They're going to be playing on a neutral site. I believe it is going to be at Mercedes-Benz Superdome in New Orleans, if I'm not mistaken, in the Sugar Bowl. Currently sitting, it's Clemson minus 7. Both teams have been undefeated as of late. 22-10 Twenty-two to ten was the last win for Ohio State versus Northwestern. Clemson dominated in Notre Dame, thirty-four to ten. This game is going to be an absolute dogfight because these two teams, almost in every single statistical category, is very similar. They both hold opponents under a hundred yards rushing. They're both sitting right around 500 yards in total offense. They're both averaging about 40-plus points per game on offense, holding teams to 21 and under on defense. They're both very similar statistically in that way. However, I think the biggest takeaway from what the conference games showed us is that with a lot of heavy pressure, with a lot of defensive disruption in the face of Justin Fields, he tends to crack. And Trevor Lawrence, what does he do? We've seen this in the past several years. When he is under so much duress, when there's so much stuff going on around him, what does he do? He knows how to move his way, shift around, and make the best play happen, in which he does almost every single time. Trevor Lawrence is exceptional in that way, and that is, you know, what happens when you are arguably the best college prospect in 10 years. When you're getting compared to greats. Like John Elway, a Hall of Famer. Peyton Manning, a future Hall of Famer. Andrew Luck. If he wasn't behind such a bad ownership and a bad management for the first several years of his career, let's say he got Chris Ballard when he started and the regime they have now when Andrew Luck started, he'd be playing still at a Hall of Fame level. And Trevor Lawrence is one of those guys. Will Trevor Lawrence go to the Jacksonville Jaguars? Most likely so. But the fact that his backup, DJ Oyangale, had a great performance against Notre Dame and 
Trevor Lawrence took the exact same Notre Dame team and just absolutely creamed them says a lot. It's why I'm going to take Clemson minus 7 because I do think that they are that good. And I think that Trevor Lawrence does bring that extra juice into the table. And then you got the other game. Number one versus number four. The Notre Dame Fighting Irish are going to be coming to Arlington to face off against the Alabama Crimson Tide. This is going to be in AT&T Stadium in Dallas with one of the biggest populations of college fans probably ever or just the biggest population of football fans Right now, the spread is currently sitting at minus 20 under Alabama. And numerically speaking, I can see why. At least in terms of the eye test. Numerically speaking, it's a little bit different. At least in terms of offense, they're kind of similar. 35 points scored for Notre Dame versus 50 for Alabama. They're both holding opponents under 20 points each. Both have very good running attacks. 190 yards up. Both holding opponents to roughly 100 yards per game on the ground and close to about 250-ish in the air. Numerically speaking, Notre Dame can keep up with Alabama, but from the eye test, I don't think they can. They both play the same amount of games. The same amount of games. Notre Dame 10-1, and Alabama 11-0. and let me put some perspective on this. Number one, Alabama's got two Heisman candidates on their roster. If you included the hype Najee Harris got throughout the entire year, you can say three, but Devonta Smith and Mac Jones are the finalists at the end of the day. Same amount of games. Same number of games. We won't get nitpicky. We will just look at their leading receiver, leading rusher, and leading passer. It blows them out of the water. Let's just look at Devonta Smith up against Javon McKinley. Smith has almost 1,000 more yards, has 14 more touchdowns, and almost 60 more receptions. And then Kyron Williams is, despite having a great season, Najee Harris has just been absolutely dominant. He's got over 200 more yards and also a dozen more touchdowns in the same amount of games. And then you get Mac Jones and Ian Book. Yes, Ian Book has... Two fewer interceptions, but also he also has 1,100 fewer yards and 17 fewer touchdowns than Mac Jones. Mac Jones actually has double the amount of touchdowns as Book in the same amount of games. I think the talent level between Alabama and Notre Dame is just too great right now. Do I think Notre Dame can keep it competitive? Maybe, but if they play the way that Clemson forced Notre Dame to play or if they didn't play up to the standard of Notre Dame versus Clemson round one, then Notre Dame will struggle. Alabama's got to keep doing what they're doing. Florida was supposed to have this massive defensive powerhouse and Alabama laid 52 on them. They have three straight games with 50 plus and that includes some really tough opponents. You know, even the most recently, the number... Seven ranked Florida. I don't think Notre Dame has done 50 plus more than once. And it was way back in like week two. They've been in the high 40s multiple times. But the fact that Alabama just keeps packing on defense. Packing on. Keeps packing on points. Packing on points. Shows that they're a real threat to what Notre Dame is going to do. Yes. Yes. Florida did put up 46 against Alabama. But also, Kyle Trask is a much greater threat to everything that the Crimson Tide does as opposed to Ian Book. And that's why Alabama minus 20 is a lot. Notre Dame lost to Clemson by 24. And after halftime, Clemson took their foot off the gas. Nick Saban is not so friendly. He will pack on those points. And I am going to take Alabama minus 20 for that as well. That's been it for today. 
I hope you have an excellent new year. I hope that these games turn out absolutely fantastic as they should be. Enjoy the view. Enjoy the new year. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the GSMC College Football Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Be sure to rate us five stars and leave a comment. We really appreciate everything that you guys have been doing with us throughout the entirety of 2020. And just like with this show, we hope your 2021 goes absolutely amazing. Be sure when you can, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or all your favorite social media platforms. Be sure to follow us. Be sure to look us up. And for all of us here at the GSMC Podcast Network, come find us on the next installment of the GSMC College Football Podcast where we are 100% going to be talking about these starting final games going into the national finals on the next installment of the GSMC College Football Podcast. I am Ryan Lee. I've been your host. I hope you have an excellent new year and a great rest of your night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network, from football to basketball, baseball to MMA, and even soccer. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast.